Around 3 p.m. on May 1st, 2004, Superman Ride of Steel at Six Flags New England was operating normally. A train sat in the station being loaded. This loading cycle was somewhat abnormal as a rider was being loaded through the ride's exit. The rider, later revealed to be about 5 foot 2 inches tall and weighing over 230 pounds, boarded the ride from a mobility scooter into a seat in the front half of the train. Ride operators attempted to secure the rider into the restraints. Due to the size of the rider's upper body, they were unable to do this and asked the rider to move to row 1, as it was known to have a more accommodating seatbelt. The rider was secured by the larger seatbelt and the T-bar style lap bar was pushed down to touch the rider's upper body. The train was dispatched from the station and the ride began. During the ride experience, a rider behind the rider in the front row noticed that the rider in the front row was, quote, getting air on some of the negative G moments of the ride. The rider behind them grabbed the front row rider's clothing in an attempt to hold them down. Near the end of the ride, the rider in the front row became completely free of the restraints, and as the train traversed a sharp turn, they were ejected from the ride. In the process, their wrist was hit by the wheels of the train, and their body hit a support column before flying into the ground and a fence near the ride, killing the rider. The ride operators were informed of the ejection and emergency stopped the ride. Several riders jumped the fence where the ejected rider was and attempted to administer medical care along with park officials until an ambulance arrived. The investigation by the Massachusetts Department of Public Safety began immediately. The investigation would eventually determine four main contributing factors to the accident. The first factor was the girth of the victim. The victim's body was incompatible with the T-bar style restraint as it prevented the T-bar from being lowered properly onto the rider's legs to prevent the rider from being ejected. The second factor was a pre-existing condition. Per local laws at the time, the rider was required to notify the operators of any pre-existing conditions. This did not occur. The rider had attempted to ride Superman in the past and was denied. It's unknown if they disclosed their conditions in the past. The third factor was the varied size of seatbelts on the ride. This allowed for riders who may have had a body size or type that was incompatible with the T-bar style lap bar to ride without making them or the operators aware of the potential hazard. The fourth factor was the failure of the ride attendants to recognize that the T-bar was not positioned properly on the rider. In order for the T-bar to work properly, it must be positioned firmly against a rider's upper thighs. Due to the girth of the ejected rider's upper body, this was not how the T-bar was positioned. Even with a seatbelt, a rider with these body proportions cannot safely ride. With the core contributing factors discovered, it's time to look deeper at the factors that were at play on May 1st, 2004 that had an impact on this accident. This will allow us to reconstruct a complete view of all that allowed this accident to happen. Starting with the ride's operation. Six Flags did not and still does not use a third-party ride operator training or auditing program and instead trains all their operators in-house. On the day of the accident, Superman was operating with three operators, one in the control booth working the ride's controls, and two platform operators checking restraints on each side of the train. There were several media reports of interviews of people who witnessed the accident claiming that the operators failed to check the unload side of the train, the side where the ejected rider was sitting before the train dispatched. However, these claims are not substantiated by the accident report. This also seems unlikely as the operators had to spend extra time trying to secure the ejected rider into this side of the train. What the accident report does state about the operators is that they failed to notice that the ejected rider had body proportions that were incompatible with the T-bar style restraint due to the size of the rider's upper body compared to their lower body. This caused the T-bar to rest against the rider's stomach rather than the rider's thighs. This should have been noticed by the ride operators and they should have denied the rider access to the ride. Moving on to the ejected rider themselves. They had several conditions that made walking very difficult. They were somewhat of a regular at the amusement park and had visited several times before, each time using a mobility scooter to get around as they could only walk for a few steps at a time. They had attempted to ride Superman before and had been denied. The state law at the time required riders to disclose any pre-existing conditions to ride operators before boarding. Ride operators would then determine if the ride was safe for that rider to ride. This was not done and parks have since moved to a much more streamlined system for alternate access on rides, and we'll discuss that more later. Regarding the alternate access the ejected rider used on the day of the accident, the system employed by the park looks quite antiquated today. Reading from Six Flags New England's website in 2004, riders with disabilities were to stop by guest relations and receive a guidebook on safely riding attractions. Additionally, it states that riders with mobility impairments may be denied boarding by a ride operator if they feel it is not safe for that rider to ride. No specific guidance is provided. Also notice that this system provides no guidance for riders with amputations. 
This would become important a few years later in a different accident. In this way, it treats alternate access of attractions for riders with disabilities as an afterthought and is something that will be determined each time a rider tries to ride. We will talk about the changes to the system that have occurred since in a moment, but the vagueness of this system undoubtedly contributed to the accident. Finally, it's important to discuss the ride's manufacturer, Intamin. Intamin rides were the site of multiple rider ejections in the early 2000s, most of which involving riders of unusual body proportions and T-bar restraints. In each case, the restraint system of the rides was called into question. Intamin's U.S. President Sandor Kernix was asked about this accident by media reporters at the time, and he responded by saying, It's impossible to avoid an accident. Every accident is tragic and we should strive not to have any, but accidents do happen. The question is, what is an acceptable number? He also questioned the Americans with Disabilities Act, or ADA, saying, The ADA. This is the biggest issue. It puts the park in an awkward situation. They have to allow access to all. This statement is not only blatantly false, but it's also important to note that no other ride manufacturer at the time had serious issues regarding the safety of riders with unusual body proportions. Rival ride manufacturer B&M even created a body harness that allows riders with serious amputations to ride safely and offers parks the option to buy trains with a few specifically designed seats for riders with larger bodies. It seems that Intamin, at least at the time, failed to account for riders that were not the average theme park guest. This would result in the state of Massachusetts banning the T-bar style restraint and forcing Intamin to design new restraints for the ride. The original restraints of the ride could be left in any position and the ride would still allow a train to be dispatched from the station. There were seatbelts installed to help act as a measuring device for ride operators to determine if riders could safely ride, but these seatbelts were different sizes depending on what seat they were in resulting in them not being a reliable means to measure riders. With all of this known, we can now reconstruct an accurate recreation of the events leading up to and occurring on the 1st of May 2004. The ride was made by Intamin and had been operating for the last three years with one incident occurring in the past. This incident occurred in 2001 where an airline burst on the ride's final brakes due to a design flaw, causing two trains to collide at moderate speed. The ride seatbelts were longer in the front row than in other rows, despite no changes being made to the ride's actual restraints in this row. On May 1st, 2004, Superman at Six Flags New England was operating normally. The ride was being operated by three operators, one in controls, one checking the unload side of the train, and one checking the load side. A rider with several mental and physical impairments attempted to board the ride through the exit using a mobility scooter. The rider boarded the train without assistance but was unable to secure the seatbelt due to the size of their upper body. The ride operators moved the rider to the front row on the unload side of the ride so they could use the longer seatbelts. They buckled the rider's seatbelt and pushed the T-bar into the rider's gut. The train was dispatched from the station. As the train traversed the layout, the rider in the front row unload side started getting air on some of the negative G moments of the ride. The rider behind them attempted to hold them down to prevent them from being ejected. As the ride was exiting the final airtime hill and banked to the right to make the final turn into the brakes, the rider in the first row unload side was ejected from the ride after being subjected to an instantaneous change from negative 0.4 Gs to positive plus 2.9 Gs. As the rider was ejected from the car, their left hand came in contact with the coaster's rails and the rear wheel assembly on the first car of the train, severing the rider's left hand and part of their left arm. The rest of the rider was flung into a support beam near the end of the ride, where it then traveled another 31 feet before hitting the ground, then going another 38 feet before striking a chain link fence around the ride. Several riders hopped the fence in an attempt to assist the ejected rider. The train returned to the station with the lap bar still in place and the seatbelt still buckled. Park first aid arrived and assisted with medical care until an ambulance arrived. The rider succumbed to their injuries and the ride was closed for investigation. This accident led to several changes in several areas of the industry, starting with the ride itself. The state of Massachusetts issued a ban on the T-bar style restraints used on the ride. This led to a redesign of the restraints to be more restrictive but also more safe. The ride would use these redesigned restraints until 2008 when it received more streamlined restraints that still satisfy the safety requirements made by the state. These new restraints are designed for all riders who meet the height and amputation requirements to be able to ride safely. If a rider meets these requirements, it's impossible for them to escape from the restraints when it's in its minimum allowed position. 
This is the same design philosophy that has guided B&M's coasters since their inception. These new restraints also feature seat sensors. These are magnetic sensors located inside the ride's trains that measure the position of the ride's restraints. If a restraint is not in the minimum allowed position, a train will not be allowed to leave the station by the ride's control system. These have become a standard feature on many coasters today, but notably many new Intamin rides still do not feature these sensors. This accident has also had a major impact on the way that alternate access at parks works and how the ADA is interpreted for amusement parks. Prior to this accident, riders with disabilities were treated on a case-by-case -case basis, leading to inconsistencies that ultimately contributed to this accident. Following this accident, parks began to move to the modern system parks use today. This system works by having each rider seeking alternate access accommodations, visit a guest services or guest relations location, and be evaluated by someone trained on rider safety and ride admission policy as it relates to rides at that park. This evaluator will then determine what rides can safely accommodate that rider and issue a pass that only allows that rider to board attractions that can safely accommodate them. This takes much of the subjectivity out of the system and leads to a much more streamlined and safe experience for riders with disabilities. This system is not perfect and is ever evolving, and unfortunately it would not become mainstream in the industry fast enough to prevent another accident from occurring in 2008 on a similar Intamin roller coaster, but that's a topic for another video. The accident on Superman Ride of Steel has changed many aspects of the industry. It changed how ride admission policy and riders with disabilities are treated at parks, it contributed to the decline of Intamin rides in the United States, and it changed many ideas around restraint design. Lessons learned from this accident are still applied in many industry settings today, and it's safe to say the legacy of this accident will live on for some time to come. To see more information about this accident, feel free to read the full accident report linked in the description of this video. And if you're interested in learning more about this ride specifically, I suggest watching El Toro Ryan's Problematic Coasters episode covering this ride, as it goes much more into detail about the ride itself and its history. Finally, I invite you to learn more about the second accident on a similar Intamin ride in an upcoming video on this channel within the next few weeks. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.